Today we pick back up in Genesis chapter 32, and excuse me, chapter 33, and we're going to be looking at verses 12 through 20, finishing out this chapter. Now I've titled today, Tried, Tempted to Revert, because in this part of the chapter, Jacob begins to wrestle with his old nature. He begins to have this struggle to go back and, and to be deceptive in a sense, to tell a half-truth in order to do something else. Now the difference in this case though is that we see Jacob near the end of our passage today turning back to the Lord with an altar. But let's read this passage then we'll hit on some details, walk through it. So Esau said, excuse me, verse 12, Then Esau said, Let us journey on our way and I will go ahead of you. But Jacob said to him, My Lord knows that the children are frail, and that the nursing flocks and herds are a care to me. If they are driven hard for one day, all the flocks will die. Let my Lord pass on ahead of his servant, and I will lead on slowly, at a pace of the livestock that are ahead of me, and at the pace of the children, until I come to my Lord in Seir. So Esau said, Let me leave with you some of the people who are with me. But he said, What need is there? Let me find favor in the sight of my Lord. So Esau returned that day on his way to Seir, but Jacob journeyed to Succoth and built for himself a house and made booths for his livestock. Therefore the name of that place is Succoth. And Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, on his way from Padan Aram, and he camped before the city. And from the sons of Hamor, Shechem's father, he brought for a hundred pieces of money the pieces of land on which he pitched his tent. There he erected an altar and called it El Elohi Israel. Now, there are some interesting things about Shechem. I've included a link in today's uh, title right underneath that so that you can look at some more about Shechem. Before we get there, and Shechem will be very important as we dive into the next chapter tomorrow. But before we get there, let's begin walking through what happens. Jacob has finally met Esau. It's as if meeting Esau was as seeing the face of God. He had reconciliation. He had grace that he did not deserve. They're reconciled to one another. And Jacob urges Esau to take the gifts that he has prepared for him. Jacob has a heart of humility rather than a heart of fear. He is standing amazed by the grace of God, really, and, and by the kindness of his brother um, in the middle of all of this. But then in verse 12, Esau says, you know, let's journey our way and I'll go ahead of you. Come, come to see air. Come where I am. Come live with me is what Esau is saying. But Jacob says, My Lord knows the children are frail and the flocks and the herds, if they are driven hard for one way, will one day will die. Now it seems that Jacob is, is exaggerating here. Come on, if he drives the flocks a little bit faster and, and pushes the family a little bit faster, is it really going to kill him in one day? He, he's exaggerating and using hyperbole definitely here. It certainly appears he is being tempted to revert to his deceptive nature. So he tells Esau to go on ahead of him, that he will come more slowly at the pace of his flocks and with his kids. And he will come, he says, to Edom. He will come meet Esau in Seir, which is the land of Edom. The thing is, though, that Jacob does not go there. Verse 15 shows us that Esau tries to leave some of his people, some of his 400 men, the standard number of a militia in those days. He tries to leave some of his men with Jacob to you know, provide protection and help them to go there. But Jacob is like, what need is there if I found favor in your sight? So Esau returns that day. He goes back to Seir, back to his home, his land of Edom. But Jacob journeys to Succoth. Succoth is where Jacob builds himself a house, and he builds booths for his livestock. He builds, uh, basically that's, that's barns. He builds temporary shelters for them to stay in. He stays at Succoth for a while, and the, the literal name of that place is booths which is similar to the uh, word we would think of as tent. When the children of Israel talk about making booths, they're talking about uh, tents. They dwelt in booths, they say in the desert. Well, they, they mean tents. They just use a little bit different word there. But Jacob, nonetheless, does not go with his brother. Now, why is this? Well, we know that Jacob and Esau, 
from before the time they were ever born, God has declared that they both would father different nations. Different peoples would come from them. They were not going to be united. To this day, and then throughout the Bible, the people of Edom and Israel are still having animosity toward one another. They're not unified. There's this animosity between the descendants of Esau, the descendants of Jacob. Now there is a peace, a great reconciliation and a grace that God gave between the two brothers here in chapter 33. But Jacob starts back in his deceptive ways. He's tempted to revert. Remember, he was just gloriously saved in chapter 32. And yet, even though he just wrestled with Christ, he's been humbled, he's redeemed, he still has that deceptive nature. He, he lies to his brother. There's no mincing words about it. He does not go to Seir. He does not go to Edom. He goes to Succoth. He builds himself a house. First time he's ever had that of his own. And builds booths for his livestock. And he stays there for a while. But then in verse 14, uh, 18, Jacob comes safely to the city of Shechem. And I want to spend a good part of our time here because Shechem is going to be a very key component to understanding what unfolds in chapter 34 as we dive in tomorrow. Jacob is behaving differently. Now he still is having this struggle between his flesh and the spirit. And I, and I want to read a couple verses on that that come from the New Testament. Over in Galatians chapter 5, We find Paul saying some things that apply very well to what we're reading here in Genesis. In Galatians chapter 5, and I'm going to read several verses kind of throughout the chapter, verse 1 says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not again submit to a yoke of slavery. He goes on to say, down in verse 9, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Then he jumps down even farther to say in verse 16, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh, verse 17, are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. These are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you were led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. What we see happening in Jacob's life is this struggle with his old fleshly nature. He has been given a new nature in Christ. He has been born again. But now, even though he has been humbled, he is having that temptation to revert to the ways of his flesh when he begins to deceive Esau. Now, the encouraging part, though, is we're going to see the end of chapter 33 here in Genesis is that it ends on a note of Jacob acknowledging God and building an altar to the Lord. He's worshiping the one true God. Again, this is very different from Jacob in the past. When he deceived in the past, he was not repentant. He was not turning to the Lord. There was no indication that he really cared at all. He just was concerned about God bless me, you know, help me to, to get good wages and, and get the wife I'm going to get for my uncle, bring me back safely to my, my parents, and if you do all that, God, then I'll, I'll give you a tithe. That was the attitude of Jacob earlier on in Genesis, but now there is such a difference in his heart. But here in Galatians chapter 5 and over in Romans, we also see Paul talk about the same thing. And Paul uses so many words in the way he says it that it's a tongue twister. He says, I do the things that I don't want to do, and the things that I don't want to do, I do. He's talking about how he knows that he needs to be living for Christ, and yet he still has that desire and battle fighting his flesh. As believers, we are in spiritual war against our flesh. It requires daily crucifixion to die to our old life to our old sinful nature, and to choose each day to walk with the Spirit, to submit ourselves to walking with the Lord. It's an everyday walk. And Jacob is just beginning this. He's a baby Christian beginning to walk in these steps. And God has humbled him, which is going to result in his continued spiritual growth. But Jacob is not yet a spiritual leader. He's not yet maturing in his faith. We're going to see that later on in chapter 35. Jacob is going to really begin to be the man of God that God had called him to be. But again, I'm getting ahead of myself. Today, let's turn back to Genesis 33. And let's look back in verse 18. 
Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem. Now I have included a link uh, underneath the title today of the video so that you can look a little bit more at Shechem. Shechem is so key to understanding tomorrow in chapter 34 where we're going to pick up. Shechem is the city and, and many commentaries I read said that Shechem is a type of the world. It represents the world. Now, interestingly, Shechem was also the first place that Abraham went. Shechem was also a very important place in uh, Israel's history. It was the first capital of Israel in the book of Judges when a man proclaims himself king. It was the uh, place where Joshua gives a decree to the nation of Israel. It is a very key city throughout Israel's history. Yet it's not an Israelite city yet. It's a pagan city. And Shechem, you could kind of say, is kind of like Sodom and Gomorrah with Lot. It reads kind of the same way, too, here in Genesis chapter 33. And Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, on his way to Padan Aram. And he camped before the city. That's the same type of thing you saw happen with Lot. Now, the difference with Lot is that Lot specifically went towards Sodom and pitched his tent there because he saw the fertile valley. Ooh, he could get rich there. It was good for his flocks. He and Abraham have to split up. Their, their servants are arguing with one another. There's strife. They have too many possessions for them to live together anymore. That's back earlier on in Genesis. We've already talked about this. Lot chose the way of the world. And Lot was a believer. The New Testament tells us that. But Lot was saved by the skin of his teeth. The angels had to come and literally drag him and his family out of Sodom. He was so in love with the world. God in His mercy saved Lot. But Lot is not an example to emulate. He's the example of a believer that has been living a life of worldliness and backslidden. Abraham, however, chose to serve God. We saw that earlier on in Genesis. Here, Shechem, many of the commentaries I read said, is, is a picture of the world. It's very similar to like Sodom and Gomorrah was for Lot, but there's a difference that occurs with Jacob. Number one, Jacob does not go live in the city. Jacob camps before the city, and in verse 19, from the sons of Hamor, Shechem's father, he brought, bought for a hundred pieces of money a piece of land. He buys a piece of land on which he pitched his tent. But then verse 20 is so different. Lot does not do this earlier on in Genesis. And this is why even though we see that, that flicker of Jacob's deception come back up on the screen, he lied to Esau, he came this way towards Succoth and then now to Shechem, rather than saying what he was going to do, which was go be in Seir with his brother in Edom. He lied about that. His flesh flared up. But the chapter ends in verse 20. There he erected an altar and called it El Elohi Israel. This means God, the God of Israel. Jacob ends with worship. He was humbled in the beginning of this chapter. His flesh reared up, but it ends with him returning to a place of worship at the altar with God. That is different than we've seen in the past. And what a testimony that is for us to look at this as an application. Because the truth is, in our Christian lives, you know, many times new believers struggle with, you know, Jesus has saved me from everything, and oh no, I just sinned again. What do I do? 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sin, He is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. The Christian life is one of continual repentance. It's not one-time repentance. John the Baptist put it this way in, in the New Testament. He said, live lives keeping with repentance. It's a continual process of repenting. It says in the book of Proverbs that a righteous man falls seven times but gets back up. But the wicked fall and stay down. When the wicked sin, they fall and they just keep staying down in sin. They don't get back up. But when a believer falls into sin, they get back up because the Spirit of God lives within them. He draws them back to Christ. They confess their sin. You see, we need to have quick repentance. He humbles them. They have a broken and contrite heart and they continue to walk with Christ. They continue to fight that battle against the flesh and against Satan. Our battle is not with flesh and blood. Our battle is not with people. It's not with political figures. There are ideas and worldviews that Satan is behind. That is what our flesh is with. Our, our battle and our struggle is with Satan and his demons. Satan is the god of this world. He is the ruler of this world. 
But Jesus Christ saves us from the power and domain of Satan, gives us a citizenship in heaven, and now we have a new identity, a new home. We are strangers and pilgrims. We are aliens in this world. And Jacob is just now beginning to see that. He started out humble. He sinned. He comes back to a place of worship. It's a powerful lesson we learn from this chapter, and it's a powerful application for our lives as well. Now let me hit on just a couple of other things, the meaning of some names that will kind of set the stage for tomorrow. Shechem was the name of a person, but it's also the name of a city. Many cities in the Bible here in the early days of the scriptures were named after people. Their founding members, you could say, or their founding uh, tribal leaders many times. Shechem is a word which means shoulder. Hamor, the son of uh, who is the son here we see in verse 19. Excuse me, he's the sons of Hamor. This name means donkey, clay, or dirt. Now that's going to be pretty important because if you remember before in Scripture, we've seen another guy that had the name that meant a donkey. That was Ishmael. He would be a donkey of a man, God said. Well, Hamor, his son, Shechem, is going to be a donkey of a man in chapter 34 something to keep in mind tomorrow but these names mean something then El Elohi Israel means God the God of Israel Shechem meaning shoulder it's a very beautiful land as that link with some other tools and descriptions of it I included will will tell you it's a very beautiful place but yet it had the donkey of a man that was living within it it had a worldly people and we're going to see that in chapter 34. I don't want to get ahead of myself. And yet, in outside of this worldly city, outside of this, is where Jacob builds an altar to the Lord. and He worships God. Very interesting. It reminds me of the city of Corinth. The city of Corinth was such a worldly city. If you would refer to a woman as a, a Corinthian woman in Paul's day, it meant that she was a harlot. That city was so identified with worldliness and immorality that to call someone a Corinthian meant that you are ascribing to them sexual immorality. In the middle of that city, God sent forth the gospel by the Apostle Paul and the church was planted. That church struggled with, well, the church there struggled with many temptations to revert to a life of worldliness. In the, the letter to the first Corinthians, you see Paul having to write very clear instructions about marriage and about living a moral life and abstaining from sexual morality because this church was so grounded in that culture. And yet, in the middle of that culture, God establishes, so to speak, the altar to His name. God, the one true God, was worshipped. And that church ended up being a strong church later on, a testimony to the power of the gospel that God can transform people no matter where they are, even in the middle of the hotbed of the world. And all the rampant sin there, the gospel can still go forth. That's a powerful testimony to us. And we're going to pick up next time in chapter 34, and we're going to see Jacob's daughter be raped. And yet we see Jacob respond with such a grace and compassion in the midst of this. He, he does not engage in lashing out in anger as he did before. Now we're going to see his sons do some things. And I don't want to completely unpackage the, the chapter ahead of time, but we're going to see that next time and to see the continued pattern of Jacob's sanctification, his walk with the Lord. But at the same time, we're going to see that the sins of a father affect the children. Jacob's previous example affects how his sons respond. If you join me in prayer today, Father, we thank you for your word. We see the pattern of, of Jacob struggling, Lord, with you wrestling with Christ, emerging with a new name that he has prevailed with God. He struggled, Lord, but you humbled him. You brought him to a place of redemption. You extended your grace that he did not deserve. You redeemed him. Lord, despite everything that Jacob had done 20 years prior, you brought reconciliation between him and Esau, an unexpected reconciliation. And they split ways, 
Jacob not quite telling the truth. Well, no, he wasn't telling a white lie. He was completely lying. But Father, as he continued on, he ends in this chapter worshiping you. You didn't let go of him when you redeemed him, Father. He didn't even let go of him before he was quote-unquote saved. We praise you for the lessons we learned from Jacob. Not, not many lessons to emulate. He wasn't a good example in many things. But Lord, lessons that point to the power of your grace and the gospel that you extend toward us. It's not about us being good enough. It's about us being humble and contrite, surrendering all to you. Lord, we are saved completely by grace. It's a free gift. It's nothing we can earn. And the fact that you've saved us simply gives a powerful testimony to your glory, God, and your power. Nothing about ourselves. Lord, help us where we struggle with the flesh, like Jacob. Lord, help us to confess our sin, to come back to the altar, come back to a place of repentance as other scriptures clearly teach us. We praise you and we thank you for sending Jesus Christ, who has given us His Spirit, not only to save us and to seal us for a destination of eternal life in heaven, but also to give us the power to live today for Christ. Help us to walk with the Spirit, Father, so that we will not gratify the desires of of our old nature of the flesh. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.